Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Raven, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today, we're going to have another very interesting show. We have with us the filmmaker of this film, Conspiracy of Silence, from Ireland, John Deary. It's a film that I would highly recommend you see. It concerns the subject of celibacy in the Roman Catholic Church and the way this homosexuality and AIDS is splintering it organically, if you will, from within. It's a film of, of great moment, of great importance for people to understand what has been going on behind the scenes and it gives us a window in to that world which very few people actually get to see who are not on the inside. John just flew in from London to receive a, an award on this film, as did Michael Moore receive the same award for Fahrenheit 9-11 and Mel Gibson for The Passion of Christ. This is the level of the film as this award ceremony clearly recognized. We're very glad to have John with us today to talk about the nature of the film, what went into making it, and uh, its, uh, its role in today's society. Thanks, Mitchell. Absolutely. Good to see you, John. Yes, thank you very much. It's very nice absolutely, absolutely. inviting me. What uh, initially inspired you to make this film in the first place? Well, what, what I often say to people when I'm asked that question, and I've been asked it all over the world, really, by journalists, is it was it, the film and the topic chose me, in, in a way. Um, it was leading up to the millennium. I, as a practicing Catholic, was pondering the whole notion and relevance of celibacy in the Catholic Church, why it was there, why we had it. You were raised in... Yeah, I was raised as a Catholic, but both parents... In Dublin? Or no, in where? Donegal, mm -hmm. in uh, Northwest Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, between Donegal and the UK. My, mm -hmm. my parents and all my family are all Irish, so... And I was brought up into a Catholic background where we went to Mass every Sunday and did all of the things. Were you an altar boy? I was an altar boy for a time, for mm -hmm. about a year. My mother, looking back now, my, I could see that my mother was uncomfortable with that. She didn't want me to be an altar boy. I didn't know why at the time, but now, uh, now I can, I can <laughs> see why. But I was an altar boy for a time. And my mother was a devout Catholic, never missed church on a Sunday, and we always went to church on a Sunday. And then, as you do, you know, reached the age of 16, 15, 16, there were certain questions that I had that the Catholic Church, and in particular our local parish priests, could just not answer for me. And I, like so many people of my generation, moved away from Catholicism. But, you know, I got married, had children. I think that made me, uh, circumstances in my life um, made me not quite as antagonistic towards the Catholic Church. I went through my own personal development that I needed to do and uh, I came out the other end and I, I warmed a little bit, if you like, to the Catholic Church, although certainly there's a lot in the Catholic Church that I absolutely disagree with and, and, I, and I think the Catholic Church is in badly need, uh, in, in badly need of reform. But anyway, just to cut a long story short, leading up to the millennium, I was looking for a subject to direct a drama about that would be my first film. And I, I thought about a lot of subjects, and this recurring theme of Catholicism and celibacy kept coming back. I'd pick up a newspaper article in the UK, there would be an article about the Catholic Church about to be sued, taken to court, there would be horrendous articles about abuse, there would be mm. the uncovering of bishops' children and love children, all sorts of stuff. Mm. And I just, I was just literally pondering one day this, why do we have celibacy? And I began mm. what ended up about 18 months of research. I read books, I met priests, I met priests in Italy, I met priests in Ireland, I met priests in the UK. I interviewed them. Once I got below the surface and I, I got away from the, the official line and, I re and, and, and these guys opened up to me and told me their stories, they were absolutely unbelievable and shocking. And the movie, Conspiracy of Silence, is based on real life events. Obviously what I had to do as initially the writer of the piece, I had to turn it into a story that hopefully would engage an audience in a, in a movie theater, rather than you know have it as, a, as, as an intellectual debate about celibacy, which is best left 
to talk shows and theologians and, uh, and other people, <laughs> intellectuals, but academics, m academics yes, and, and my job as a filmmaker was to try and put together a story that people could relate to on a human level, and, and hopefully, you know, I've been able to do that in, in, cons in Conspiracy of Silence. So really the subject matter selected me, the more I researched it, the more I became hooked, the more I wanted to find out. And it, 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 it really just snowballed from there. I would run into people in the oddest of places. An example of that is whilst researching it, a friend of a friend of mine, um, her cousin's friend found himself in London with nowhere to go, a whole set of circumstances you wouldn't believe. Anyway, he ended up a guest at a dinner party that I was invited to, and he was a seminarian who was training to be a priest, and we sat next to each other at this dinner party. At six o'clock in the evening, he didn't know he was going to the dinner party. At eight o'clock, he was sitting there. And we had next this- Next to you. Next to me. And we had this incredible four-hour conversation about uh, celibacy, about the church, uh, about him as a young, intelligent man, why I was fascinated why he wanted to go into the priesthood. Uh, we talked about the whole celibacy notion, and things like that happened. Was you know. he one of the protagonists of the film? Was he who was being portrayed as the young man who was also in love with um, the young woman? Well, or not? He, he, not really. He, he was the, 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 the main protagonist of the film, the character Daniel, is a combination of people, really. Oh, okay. The, the, it, it, there was maybe some elements of, <coughs> of that young guy's mm -hmm. story, and then there were other priests I met, and then uh, r general research I did. So what I wanted to do was to try and build a character that we as an audience could relate to, that we could see the central dilemma, which is that this young man, a bright, intelligent man, had a vocation was called God. And at the same time, he was in love with his childhood sweetheart and the t uh, never the twain shall meet but of course he has to make a choice and he ends up opting for the seminary as, as you know having seen the movie mm -hmm. and he goes there but but then r things happen within the seminary where he's dismissed uh, unjustly for something he didn't do and as a result of that his love or his relationship I should say is rekindled because I think his love was always there and there is a, a real dilemma facing the Catholic Church at the moment I in the 21st century and it's this, over the past 25 years, 100,000 priests have left the priesthood. Now, they certainly all haven't left because they all want to be married, but a, a, a large majority of them have left because of that. And others have left because they realize that, they, that, you know, that they're not allowed to have sex, or as um, famous ex-presidents of the US would say, sexual relations. And, um, and of course, that for me, I would say that, that is un, uh, untenable for, for any human being. And in particular, you know, for young guys, I mean, if you sign up to be a priest at the age of 22 or 23, and you go through seven years of rigorous education, and then you come out the other end and you're ordained, and then you're expected to remain celibate, it's a tall order for any human being. By so, means. yeah, so, uh, but, uh, absolutely. And, and, and so for me, I wanted us as an audience to identify with that central dilemma in Daniel and for us to understand the, the agony that, that he goes through and the choices he has to make. It also begs the question, I mean, there are many splinterings that come from this central dilemma, one of which just has to be mentioned right now is that what is the difference? How do we understand the difference between love of God and love of man? Hmm. Where does the difference begin and end? Mm. Is there actually one? Mm. Or is love of God expressed through love of man? Yeah. Man and woman, or any combination thereof. Mm. You know? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point because if you, if you go back to the time of Christ, I mean, f for me, as a practicing Catholic, I think if there was a time machine invented and somebody said to me, John, you can go back to any point in history, where would it be? I would go back to the time of Christ. Because for me, it is the most interesting time and the whole cornerstone of Christianity uh, is about whether or not you know Christ died on the on the cross and and, and was resurrected or not. And I've I've read a lot of books about Christ, mm -hmm. a huge amount of books, just pure out of personal interest myself. Now, if you if you look at if you look at Christ, he was 
a Palestinian working class Jew from the wrong side of the tracks who was, if you like, a democratic socialist who metaphorically threw a grenade into the temple and he went against the status quo at the time, he went against the Jewish authority and he was killed and you know of course Mel Gibson's film that shared the National Board of Review award with myself last night deals with those last 12 hours of Christ from from Gethsemane to when he is uh, put up on the cross and of course what happened there you know there, there was a political and economic decision made at the time now it was highly unlikely at the time of Christ that a 33 year old man would not be married highly unlikely part of uh, of their duty was to be married and to procreate. And Our understanding was that he was a rabbi as well. Absolutely, he was a and rabbi. And all rabbis are married. Yeah, all rabbis it's are married. It's just any man of age 33 yeah. in general, but any man who is also a rabbi at 33, definitely in yeah. particular. So, so uh, exactly. And, and, and this is one of the things that I always found difficult to, to understand as, as a Catholic. I thought, it just this just does not make sense to me and these are some of the questions that I had at 16, 17, 18 of course now years later I, 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 I'm reasonably more articulate and I can, I can talk, talk about them and I also one of, one of the books I read was a very interesting book by a scholar in Australia Dr. Barbara Thiering who looked into the whole life of Christ and she has studied and studied the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran scroll, mm -hmm. Scrolls and looked at that and according to her, now I'm not a scholar so therefore scholars will, can argue the opposite of this, but according to Dr. Barbara Thiering what she said was that uh, there is evidence that Christ um, n was married and that he had to, in fact according to her, if my memory serves me correctly, he had two wives, we think his first wife died, he was married again, he had two children. Now of course that does not fit in to what the Catholic Church wants us to believe. He was the son of God, he, he, was, he was crucified, he, he, he died and he rose again. Now my own theory, and I, once again I don't have any evidence for this, but my own theory is that he may almost have died, he was taken down from the cross because there was a certain amount of sympathy for him. He was looked after and probably made a recovery, almost died. Six weeks later, on the road to Damascus, he appears to Paul. And there is, and and the underground movement of Christianity began then, because because the, 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 the scriptures were written um, a couple of hundred years after Christ, and you know, I mean, you, you let two hundred years elapse, and then you can virtually put down what you want. Exactly. So, you know, uh, that does not mean, from my point of view, that and I do it not believe. It appears that they have. Yeah, I think I think they have. I mean, uh, there's no doubt. It doesn't mean, from my point of view, that I'm not a Christian. I am a Christian, mm -hmm. and I. I, pr I try to practice the principles of what Christ taught and, you know, uh, l love and, and service to what fellow we've humanity. Attributed to, yeah, to what we've attributed what we've to Christ, attributed. yeah. And just because the texts may have not arisen for a couple of hundred years does not mean that they don't have validity, mm. even connected to Christ, yep. or validity on their own. Absolutely. It just doesn't mean that. It, yeah. They have their own magnificence. I think we all agree. Actually, absolutely, or many agree. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you know he was a great man. He was a great teacher, and his philosophy went against the grain at the time. Well, you're also referring to an entire body of work that is highlighted in books like Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Yeah, and more recently, of course, the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, which I've read. And <laughs> brings forth an entire. Yeah. Uh, perspective that is radically different than anything that the Catholic Church has held so yes. dear and the historical record also shows major deletions in um, in practices protocols policies of the Catholic Church to accord with their increasing economic and political control over Europe in the in the early days so mm -hmm. there are many important questions I want to come back to the film for a second because you have sought a certain trajectory here and opened up such a wonderful um, can of worms, so to speak, that I think is very useful because you're bringing forth in an extremely elegant way, may I say, an aesthetically pleasing way, um, the truth, a, a truth about what is going on behind the scenes in the Catholic Church. And I think these devout 
churchgoers need to know what it is they're involved with. They're actually, you know, a card-carrying, paying member of. Mm -hmm. And I feel that your film really helps to serve a certain purpose there. Mm -hmm. First, of course, it's awesome and very upsetting for any viewer on one hand, but you, if I may say, you um, caress the subject so beautifully, and I just really hope that uh, the audience here takes the time to go to see it because it really, in my view, <clears throat> deserves to be among the most watched films of, of today. Thank you. Yeah. And I think you're winning the award alongside of uh, Mel Gibson and especially, I should say, Michael Moore um, really reflects that you were recognized in certain circles. I would just like to see the distribution reflect the greatness of the film. Mm. Well, I said it would like that as well because uh, the dilemma that we have, Mitchell, is this. It has been picked up by a small New York-based distributor who's, who uh, heard about the film and, and, wa and watched it and loved the film. Um, but the, obviously they, they only have a, a certain amount of P&A spend, publicity and <coughs> advertising spend. And this film, absolutely no question in my mind, this film can do the same sort of dollars at the box office that A Passion of the Christ and Fahrenheit 9-11 did. Yes. I mean, if not as much as 600 million, which, which Passion of the Christ has taken worldwide, then certainly can do a significant amount. Um, but the, the dilemma is that the distribution company we have is, is small and doesn't have that sort of spend. <coughs> but they have said that they are prepared to do a deal. If a larger distribution company or indeed a, an individual, a group of individuals come forward with a significant amount of money that, that we can get this out to a, 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 a wider audience. And mm. certainly from watching the movie all over the world, certainly from my experience from all over the world, with audiences in France, Italy, Ireland, America, Spain, uh, uh, everywhere. The, the same thing happens. Uh, people come up to me at the end and they say, you know, that's a film that really deserves to be seen. Uh, one priest who introduced himself to me in Rome, who came up to me, uh, we had a questions and answers session after the film for an hour, and it was it could have gone on for another hour. Oh. And he came up to me and he said to me, he, he said. He said, I'm a priest at the Vatican. He said, I, you know, he can't give me his name. He said, but I'm a priest at the Vatican. He put his arms around me, and all he could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you. He said, he said this is a film that I pray that every Catholic should see. And, and that it has that sort of appeal. And it's, oh, it's, yes. it's, it's a debate. It's a film that people need to see. Oh. Catholics, not just Catholics, mm. but... Uh, it, has a, it has a wider resonance. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has been one of the most powerful corporations on the planet for several, many hundreds of years. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, also, I was going to say, there was one other point I'd just <coughs> like to, to mention, which is something picked Please. up when you said before. Um, you're talking about politics and economics of the church. One of the things that I did not know until I researched the movie was this. But for the first 1,100 years since Christ, uh, priests were allowed to be married. They had wives, children, and they were passing on their property and money um, to their firstborn. And then 1,100 years in, the Catholic Church decided to bring in celibacy. And from my research, there is absolutely no question that this was not a spiritual decision. This was an economic and political decision in order to advance the Catholic Church to go on and, and conquer uh, other countries and other people. Because if you think about it for a moment, if, if, if you think about it for a moment and you, you say, okay, if the Pope is God's voice on earth, then which set of popes got it wrong? 1100 years, did the, were those popes wrong? Or was it the popes for the f uh, further 900 years? Because you can't have it both ways. That's right. So what is it? And, uh, and that yeah. is a really interesting, uh, that's a really interesting dilemma, I think, for the Catholic Church. It's something that really needs to be looked at and addressed. For me, John, as a, with a background in psychology, I actually <clears throat> look at a lot of these questions, both the content level of it, but also the whole question of authority and how and to whom we attribute authority. And it's so interesting how the Catholic Church and the Vatican in particular has sewn up this subject for so many people using the concept of faith 
and devotion. It's, I mean, it's extraordinary, mm. the accomplishment they have made. Now, this also doesn't mean that faith doesn't have a role in life. I'm not saying that at all. But I am interested in looking at the way they sewed up that idea for their own, I will, will say, perhaps self-aggrandizing purposes. Mm -hmm. And they have engaged that level of the human psyche in such a way that they have cottoned, magnetized mm -hmm. such faith, such devotion, such lack of question, except for when it comes to, you know, young altar boys turning 15 <laughs> you know, and beginning to question the setup. So God bless you, you know. Um, only for the sake of time, I want to just move on to ask you a question. Um, What's next? What I know first, of course, to get every Catholic and every other human being in the world to see this. Yeah. After we accomplish that mm. task, <laughs> um, then do you have other films? I mean, I know you have a lot more information about the Catholic Church that hasn't gotten into this film. Yeah. Uh, that is also yet another level of controversy. Yeah. Do you foresee that having a chance to also be made into a film? Um, I, to be honest, I, I'm not absolutely sure about that. I mean, uh, when I finished that period of, of, of between 15 and 18 months of research, I had so much material. I mean, yeah. material that you just would not believe. For a lifetime. F material for a lifetime yeah. that I could not possibly put into any form of script. Uh, I was told by financiers in earlier drafts of the script that it was unfinanceable as it was because I couldn't say the things I was saying. And I had to some temper it a little bit. Whether I've got the stomach to do another film at, at this moment uh, on the Catholic Church, I don't think I would go into that right now. The, the, in the future, I may well do, because I mm -hmm. do think, you know, I want to make films that are relevant, that have got something to say that people can think about. Um, I'm not a sort of popcorn director, as I would say. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I go to mm -hmm. see those movies, yes. and I can switch off, and I can enjoy, and I can go with that, but I, I do not want to make... Um, for me, I do not want to, to, to make films that I'm not in the end proud of. And regardless of what anybody thinks, says, likes, dislikes, or whatever of Conspiracy of Silence, and it's, it's my first feature as a writer and director, and I can now look at it. I know every frame of it. Mm. I can now look at it uh, with a, a bit more of a critical eye. But nevertheless, I'm proud I made it as my first film. So I would like to make films that, are, that, that have got something to say, that have got some relevance, that may touch people's lives. Um, in some way. Were you involved in political filmmaking prior to this, to y some extent? Yeah, I was involved quite heavily <coughs> with political filmmaking. I made uh, films for the Labour Party, which is now the government in the UK, Tony Blair's party. Nice. Prior to that, we had 18 years of conservative rule, and I was prepared to do anything, absolutely anything, to get rid of the Conservative government, first of all under Mrs. Thatcher mm -hmm. and then under John Major because I absolutely hated them and I thought they destroyed Britain. Yes. Right. So, uh, so I, I'm a member of the Labour Party. John Major, a major disservice. Oh, awful. <laughs> and Mrs. Thatcher, well what can I say about Mrs. Thatcher? <laughs> it's yes, not already been indeed. said. Indeed. So, um, so I made political films for the Labour Party. Right. Yeah. So there is possibility of future even on this subject. but. Let me just say, uh, I just want to thank you personally for the work that you have done in this and bringing this to the world because it's so powerful. And I really do hope that everyone sees this because it's got such uh, potency and it's based on a true story and uh, all the more reason you did it artfully. And I thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to interview me. Absolutely. Thank you. Pleasure. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. And Tune in, we're going to show you a clip of the film right after this. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'll see you.